Craig Hammer, Valentine, WWE Hall of Fame. This is professional wrestler Jimmy Bags, our Boogie Morgan man. This is Michael Strider, rock and roll photographer. Hey, this is Mikey. Hi, this is Ned Baby. This is the blues man up in the north. Little Bobby. Hi, this is Hank Braxton from Braxton.com. Ladies and gentlemen, we're listening to Frankie Slice's show, Planet 90.1.
nothing like Hawaii. The weather over here in Hawaii is really special. A place called Sunset Beach, Makaha, Haleiwa, Waimea Bay, and of course the Bondi Pipeline. No, no, no. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Uh, the the Z-Boys I'm talking, not, not the band, I'm talking like the, uh, the you talked about being a surfer uh, yeah. when you were starting out. Uh, these guys were surfers that became popular skateboarders in California. Oh, the skateboarder group. Yeah, yeah. They might have been a little after my time. You know, when I was surfing, we had the long boards without a okay. beach and all that stuff, you okay. know, and before the short boards and stuff. There wasn't a lot of skateboarders around now. Now, all the skateboarders are incredible. You know, they're skateboarders. They're making them out of bamboo. Oh, yeah. with a little bit of a gift to them. And these kids, you wouldn't believe some of the things they're doing. They're riding down these rails, down these steps, and flipping over. And, I mean, they're incredible. They're just incredible, these skateboarders. I really, uh, I really think they got a lot of guts to what they're doing. It's become a, become a great sport, especially in Hawaii. Uh, well, that's amazing. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, now, I'm going to ask you a few questions about your career. Sure. And, uh, uh, to start off, because this is where I know you from, especially, I've never met you, but I'm just saying, uh, the Buddy Holly story. Now, I always said if I ever had the chance to talk to you or meet you or whatever, I would ask you, how did you land the role as the drummer in that movie? Well, first of all, I, I played drums all my life. To get the part, you would have had to play drums because we played all the music live. I hope everybody knows that. Yeah. Gary Busey sang, Charlie Martin, I, and Charlie Martin Smith played bass, and I played drums. And it was all live music. We recorded it right then and there. A lot of people say, well, wasn't that Buddy Holly? Well, no, Buddy Howdy didn't have, he had hi-fi and all that stuff. Yeah. It would have sounded ridiculous to record his stuff. So Gary actually did all the singing. We played the music live right there. But I, I played drums all my life. I'm percussion. I played congos, bongos, okay. timbales. And I played the ukulele now, too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you had to be able to play just to get the part, which made it a great movie. You know, it, I thought the bongo was a good movie and yeah. a few of those. But I thought Buddy Howdy was one of the best kind of homegrown rock and roll movie. You know, it wasn't any violence, it wasn't any swearing. It really represented Lubbock, Texas, in the old days where we were all kind of rogues that we wore our, our blue jeans down low and yeah. kind of roll our cuffs up on our t-shirts and stuck a pack of cigarettes in our arm, you know. And yeah, yeah. Those were good days, the blue suede shoes and, you know, Levi jackets and, you know, to be a gang member there. You, you were a small bit of a small club and things, you know what I mean? Yeah. I wasn't going out killing people like it is now. It's terrible, these new gangs, but yeah. what are you going to do? Life goes on right now, you know? Yeah. But it was wonderful days. I think we really captured, I think we really captured the 50s in the Buddy Holly story. And I think Gary Busey was wonderful. He lost the Academy Award to, uh, to Al Pacino, I think it was for Dog Day Afternoon, which yeah. was a, a brilliant performance. Or it was uh, Robert De Niro, I can't remember which one it was, but it was a really fine actor that beat him up, but I thought Gary was terrific. He did all that singing live, and he really played Buddy Holly for the folks that have seen this movie. And once it happened, it's a great movie to rent because it's a really good movie. Oh, yeah, and it's, uh, it's a movie that has a good story, and, uh, and you know, in some respect, too, uh, a lot of people, you know, when I would talk about that movie with uh, other people, they, they would say, like, it didn't tell the whole story, you know? What's your reaction to that? Well, how much can you tell of a story? You could go on for days and days doing a story. You get you get the best of the best. It didn't show much uh, leading up to the plane crash and all that. It just brought us to the airport and you heard the bad news and stuff. We could have carried on and showed the plane crash and all that. We could have showed more about the Big Bopper and Richie Valen. But I think we captured the kids in Texas when they were young and becoming a rock and roll group and they... The, uh, the American Band Stand, the Ed Sullivan Show, and I think we captured all those old shows pretty good because I remember being a kid myself watching Buddy Holly on American Band Stand, the Ed Sullivan Show, and he was like a, he was my hero, you know, when yeah. Jack Domino was there and Little Richard was there, and be, little before Elvis Presley actually, and then Elvis Presley came along and stuff. You know, I'm 63 now, so I was right in that, right in that era. With the, I think some of the best rock and roll of the world in my day, you know. And, uh, well, that, 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 that explains uh, that, that part for now, or the Buddy Holly story. And uh, did you ever happen to see Paul McCartney's version of the real Buddy Holly story? You know, I don't think I did. I'd like to see that. What, what, was it a feature? Was it a yeah. documentary? 
it's a it's a documentary from uh, I believe nineteen eighty seven. It was like ten years or, or nine years after the Buddy Holly story movie that you were in. You know, I'm gonna look for that. I'm gonna look for that because I'd love to see. I think he he owned all the music rights. Michael Jackson might own them, but I think Paul McCartney at one time he owned all those music rights too of Buddy Holly, which was some great stuff, and some great songs. You know, Peggy Sue and Not Fade Away and uh, True Love Ways. And he did some really really great. He was a great writer also. Oh yeah, he, uh, very talented guy and whatnot. Uh, but uh, now uh, another film that he's been in. You also been was it were in a film called uh, James Bond License to, to Kill. License to Kill. Well, it, it wasn't one of the greatest James Bond. It was Timothy Dalton. It was a great deal to do a James Bond. You know, your agent called and said you want to go to Acapulco for twenty weeks and be in a James Bond film. I mean, I couldn't wait to go because it's a wonderful credit for an actor to be in such a prestige film. Plus, they pay you pretty good money, so oh, yeah. you know, the business to make money. And it was a great payday for me. It was a good part, and, and uh, I would have taken the part no matter what it was just to be in the James Bond. But it was a small part that I turned into a fairly decent part, the part of Heller. Yeah. And he was Robbie Dobby's, uh, Do uh, Robert Dobby's bodyguard, and uh, we sure had a lot of fun doing that. We shot that in Acapulco in Mexico City. And they traveled real good with Lear Jets, and uh, the stuntmen were incredible on that movie. Those guys, they were hanging from airplanes and jumping off cliffs, and you wouldn't believe some of the stunts that were in that movie. So it was a lot of fun just to do that movie, you know, and I enjoyed doing it. Now, that's one of the movies I haven't seen yet. I haven't seen all the James Bond movies, but I, I, I definitely want to. <laughs> well, you can rent it. It's out for rent. Like oh, I, yeah. think, I don't think, I still have a Sean Connery fan from the old days of yeah. James Bond. I always felt that he was James Bond, and nobody kind of took his place. And, and, uh, and, and, and ours was a little different twist on James Bond. It was about drugs and things and smuggling drugs and all that. And James Bond comes to the rescue and all that. But, you know, the film made a lot of money, and that's the main thing nowadays in show business. If you make a good film but nobody goes to see it, doesn't make any money. It's, yeah. it's fun, but if you don't make any money, you, you know, you got to show your film. And so the film made a lot of money. And, Everybody had a good payday on it, and I'm really glad I did it, that's for sure, because it's, like I say, it's a terrific credit. And basically, you could say you made your mark in history, because it'll, it'll be lived forever in film, you know? Well, the film plays all the time, you know, we get a little residual on that, too, which is real nice, and, uh, and like I say, doing the James Bond thing, you're, it, it puts you in a little select club that, that I think is great, like doing the Clint Eastwood film. Oh, yeah. There's only so many Clint Eastwood films, I did two of them. And I'm really happy I did them because they play all the time on television. It's like the Buddy Holly. It plays all the time on HBO. Yeah. Uh, it's, played all, it's played all over the world. I have a website, www.dogstrive.com, that, that, that I get letters from all over the world. So I'm talking about the Philippines and China and all that because of Buddy Holly. Yeah. And Eastwood movies and, and Arm is Dangerous with John Candy. Yeah. So a lot of times doing and being a character actor and doing films with, 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 with stars like that, you, you'll play the whole world, you'll play it over and over and over. And my television credits are the same way, the Hawaii Five O's and Streets of San Francisco, and yeah, yeah. you know, the Simon and Simon and Cannon and yeah. Marcus Welby and Charlie's Angels. You know, those shows are going to go on for a long, oh, uh, Mr. T, what was Mr. T? Uh, oh, it was the ATM. The ATM. Yeah. <laughs> those shows will go on for the next 10, 10 years. Oh, yeah. Fly with me because they play, you know, and it keeps you, keeps you out there because I'm basically retired. But yeah. like I say, since I've been retired, all these things are coming my way. I'm producing a, a show in Hawaii right now called Good Morning Hawaii. Yeah. And I've been to that show. I, I went to that site. You had me look it up. Yeah. And I looked it up. We're going to play in the mainland eventually. We're just getting off, getting it started, and getting the best talent from Hawaii. A lot of talents over here, a lot of music talent. Oh, yeah. There's too many actors and stuff over here because it's, it's not the action, but the music over here is great musicians over here and great singers and a whole bunch of real beautiful people. I love living here. I live in a place called Hawaii Kai, oh, yeah. which is just out of Waikiki. It's like if you're looking at Diamond Head from Waikiki, I live right on the other side of Diamond Head. It's called oh, Sleeping Lady. and. Uh, it's on the Honolulu Bay, and it's, it's really a nice place right there, you know, we, we love it here.
Florida two years because that's where you're going to make you know the money. Yeah. Off, you know? Yeah. But that's uh, that's that's it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's right. That's exactly right. But uh, but then you get lucky like me. You make yeah. Moves, you get yeah. Out of Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, that's where I hope I see myself. You know, with all these interviews that I do, I'm hoping that somebody will recognize me. You know, and you know, I'm just a 23 year old kid that does this for free. You know, the radio. So thing. you seem like you enjoy it. That's the main thing. I do. I do. I definitely do. Yeah. And, and uh, people can go to my website, which is uh, myspace.com slash Frankie Slauson, and hear all the interviews I've done so far that I've put on there, including this interview will be on there as well. Uh, but uh, anyway. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my second episode of my two-year anniversary show here on the Frankie Slauson Show. And, well, as promised, finally I uh, get to do interview number 20. I don't believe it's been 20 interviews uh, that I've done so far since July of last year. But uh, get to do kick off the 20th anniversary or 20th interview, <laughs> uh, doing an interview with uh, two guys from, uh, out of California, two guys that about 2003 went to Astoria, Oregon, or 2002. I don't know if I'm saying that right or not, but uh, somewhere around that time anyway, they made a, a, a video. Uh, these guys really, really love the Goonies. So uh, a lot of people can say that they like the Goonies, but these guys love the Goonies and they live the Goonies. And uh, their name are Ron Fugoseth and Pat Ratcliffe. Welcome to the show. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having us. <laughs> and now uh, you guys, like I said in the intro, are big Goonies fans. Now describe what what it what it means to be a, a Goonie fan or a big Goonie fan. Uh, well, the Goonies is kind of unique. I mean. You know, obviously we don't have Goonies tattoos and things like that, which we've met some people who do. Yeah. But uh, for us, I think, and for a lot of Goonies fans, it really comes down to just a movie that you're so nostalgic about that it's kind of a part of your childhood. You know, when it comes on TV, yeah. you kind of, uh, you know, remember those fun times as being a kid. And, oh, yeah. You know, a lot of people that we've met and ourselves, you know, kind of have had those uh, kind of warm feelings when the movie comes on and it kind of just spurred us to want to know a little bit more about it. Oh, sure. And, uh... You know, it's just a movie that I think we grew up and loved. Now, that would be your all-time favorite movie. Uh, do, did you guys ever like, like, the Ghostbusters or Back to the Future or anything like that? Or? Oh, yeah. I mean, we loved all the different 80s movies and, you know, everything from all the Indiana Jones to, and the higher adventure movies to the, the Goonies is kind of unique in that it was kind of one of the first, you know, family-slash-children-type movies that, that threw a little bit more edge towards it. So oh, okay. kids were swearing and talking about more adult things. <laughs> You know, it kind of had a little bit more reality. Yeah. Um, the kids were real, a little bit more kids than the typical Hollywood, you know, phony Disney kids that were on TV previously. So. Oh, so you could relate to them a little bit more. Oh yeah, yeah. Huh. Now, what 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 uh, made you guys decide to to take a trip to Astoria? Well, we were working. Just, we have a web development company, and we were working pretty heavy, just kind of going at it for a long time, and just decided we needed to break and. And Ron was poking around on the internet and came across some stuff that some other people who'd done some of those trips, and we thought, hey, let's just drive up there, you know, we'll hit some fishing in Oregon on the way, and yeah. see what comes of it. So that was just kind of, we just we took off one weekend, drove for however many hours it was, 12 and a half hours. 12 and a half hours. <laughs> oh, wow. And then uh, we were in Astoria, so. Jeez. Oh, it's kind of kind of neat because uh, The Goonies is not the only movie that was ever shot in Astoria. That kind of set the bounty to make Astoria a little popular, but... Uh, Kindergarten, uh, Kindergarten Cop was also filmed there, too. Yep, right. Kindergarten Cop, I think, Short Circuit. Um, one of the Free Willies. One of the Free Willies, right. Okay. Right. So That's right. Oh, yeah. The Ring 2. Um, oh, oh, really? Yeah. yeah, and, of course, a lot of older movies, but I think it's really a story that kind of put it, or, I'm sorry, The Goonies that really yeah. put it on the map for people. Oh, sure. And I know that's the movie that still keeps people coming back to visit it. Now, uh, did you guys ever go to that 20th anniversary that they had? Yes, yeah, um, myself and Brent uh, Holland got to go. Um, he's been doing, he's been kind of helping us doing camera work and uh, different interviews. Okay. Uh, Patrick couldn't make it, um, but we got to show kind of a sneak preview of our documentary in the theater before The Goonies was played. Okay. Uh, and that was really exciting to kind of see some initial feedback, even though it was really rough, um, from the, some of the people who were there, and that was a lot of fun. Yeah, oh, that's, that's amazing, yeah. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to start uh, this one-on-one -on -one asking you guys a little bit about growing up, you know, and, and we'll start with uh, we'll start with Ron first, you know, because okay. uh, uh, Ron, uh, now, uh, growing up, uh, what was life like growing up even before the Goonies and now after the Goonies, we'll say? <laughs> well, 
I grew up in um, in Capitola, California, which is near Santa Cruz. Okay. Um, and uh, you know, it's kind of a beach town, and so I guess some of the similarities is just living near the water. But um, I don't know. I guess we kind of had a neighborhood gang, which I kind of related to with the Goonies. You know, you got always those you know weird friends dropping by and you know going through your screen oh, door and stuff like that. And uh, you know, it's just a movie that really just kind of appealed to me as a kid. And, um, you know, I don't know, maybe getting older now, I start to get a little bit more nostalgic about things. <laughs> and, you know, the Goonies being one of them. Oh, yeah, and I absolutely. think that's just one of those things that, you know, the whole thing just kind of fell in our laps, you oh, know, yeah. with going there and seeing that the town was so similar to the way it was back when it was filmed. Yeah. Um, and just kind of spread a lot of that. And, um, I mean, now, I guess, after the Goonies, or I guess after our initial trip, which kind of spurred this whole thing on, um, you know, it, it's it's kind of weird to be connected with something like that. I mean, people, you know, search for us on MySpace and oh, sure. that stuff just from, you know, our little Goonies vacation flick. Yeah. Um, you know, which incidentally was kind of a movie that we made kind of as a joke for our wives. Yeah, yeah. Before, but, but it's true. It was, you know, I was about to just shelve it and forget about it after we showed all our friends and family until we put it on the Internet, and that's kind of what blew it up. Oh, yeah. You got like over 10,000 or... Oh, even more than 10,000 hits. What, you got over a million hits, or how many hits did it's you get? Over, it's over, oh, after we got to 100,000, we stopped counting. We've had, uh, yeah, we've had a hundred and something thousand directly, and then who knows how many on oh, YouTube, wow. YouTube and stuff like that. Yeah, people will uh, grab it and put it on their own stuff. Huh. Um, you know, which is even funnier because, you know, people on YouTube have, you know, someone yeah, took I've, it and yeah, I've seen it, on it up and made their own Good News Vacation, and so it's kind of funny to yeah. almost have a parody of something so silly that we created. <laughs> But it's really opened a lot of doors for us, and um, you know, just kind of been an exciting adventure for us. Okay. So that's, I guess, hopefully that answers your question. Well, that answers my question as far as you go. Uh, now, uh, before I get to uh, uh, Pat here, uh, I want to let you guys in on a little surprise. Uh, part of my uh, my uh, Goonies special, I was thinking about airing your your vacation as part of my little package or whatever. <laughs> as long as I got you guys' permission to do that, if that's cool with you guys, I'll. Uh, record we see we have access over here to record audio from video uh, at the radio station here and then we'll play it on the air and oh, you know age. so uh, that's what I was kind of planning as maybe either way to kick it off or, or oh, something. sure yeah yeah you have our permission okay that that well, sounds 100% cool of the rights I mean, there is some copyrighted footage in there yeah. right but um but it's a, we don't care. Yeah, well, we don't care. We don't make anybody off it or anything well, anyway. Well, so. see, see, that's the thing. Though. We, you see, as far as, you know, us, you know, as far as Pine and Nine for One goes, uh, we pay our bills over here, so it really doesn't matter what we play a lot. It's just FCC approved, you know, so. Right. But exactly. now, But now, uh, Pat, now, uh, that's your Pat Radcliffe. Uh, now tell tell the listeners here a little bit about your life, a little bit growing up. And, okay, yeah. well, I grew up in Fremont, which is, uh, gosh, I guess it's suburbia. It's outside San Francisco and San Jose. Okay. Pretty much as boring a town as you can be in. It's just nothing to do ever. And so as a kid, you're always looking for something to do to get into trouble. Yeah. Um, and there's like, you know, very few places there, but we used to kind of run around and find some, there was a couple fields and a couple little groves of trees and things like that. that as kids, we kind of, we just go out and build forts and oh, sure. shoot guns and, you know, <laughs> guns and stuff like that. And just kind of get, get into trouble a little bit here and there. And oh. so we were kind of always a little bit mischievous, always looking for a little bit of an adventure. Okay. You know, you're kind of looking for anything as a kid to just break the monotony of, of your day in day out life. And gosh, I remember uh, I remember when the Goonies came out, <laughs> it was, and it came out, and it was one of the first movies that came out on Beta. And my dad insisted on having Beta, yeah. so it was one of the only movies that like was actually put out on yep. Beta. And so I remember watching that as a kid, and we just we just fell in love with it. Oh, sure. I don't think we saw it in the theater, but I remember falling in love with it on the TV and, huh. and just wishing that 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 Fremont had something like that, some excitement like that. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. And so it kind of hung on. And then it didn't really, you know, pick up again until Ron started kicking around things. And we started, and we actually got up there and saw the locations and it all kind of came back. And we were watching the DVD on the way up there, looking at all the behind the scenes footage and it all just kind of came alive for us. And then just when we, when we put out our movie, um, just the amazing attention that it got. And just to hear everyone's, everyone's impact and how, you know, it touched their lives was kind of, it was just so exciting. And then as we, we've kind of been involved in, you know, video production and things like that and been interested in that and oh, be able sure. to meet, you know, people like Dick Donner and, and yeah. all these, you know, famous actors and to get involved with, with what they're doing, their projects and everything. It's just really been really kind of exciting. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. 
Wow, that's a, that's amazing. And uh, now, uh, have you guys always been friends, or or were you guys work partners, or how how that relationship start or friendship start? So, well, we've not we haven't always been friends. We've we've known each other probably, gosh, fifteen years. Okay. Wow. Sure. And we've been working together since two thousand. Okay. And I think we were both kind of in that. We're almost kind of in a terrible graphic design job, and I was working as a CFO. Okay. For a nonprofit, and wasn't really loving that, and I kind of got involved with, you know, the digital side of yeah. computers and whatnot. And we were just kicking around, hey, we should start a company, and we did. And then, just a couple months after we started our company, we got both got picked up by another company. Oh wow! There for a year, and then they sold us to some other company, and we spun back off again. We've been doing this ever since. So y- we've been doing like video production, okay. and web development, and stuff do, like that. Do you, so. Do you, so you guys are the owners of Oxygen Productions, then, or how, or or no, or yeah, we're 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 a corporation, and we're the owners. Oh wow! <laughs> Did you ever thought in a million years that you guys would ever own your own business? No, especially because we were what, like twenty-two, maybe, yeah. or like that, yeah. we were pretty young when it happened. And it kind of, just like the greatest things, kind of just you know one little thing happened after another, and then all of a sudden you find yourself in the situation. It's like I didn't ever plan for some of that. I sort of thought it would have happened. So oh it was sure. Kind of exciting, and um, you know we, of course, since we're together a lot, our wives are uh, great friends, and we always, you know, the four of us hang out and going you know family vacations together and stuff so it's really worked out great oh sure wow that's uh that's amazing now now now, now you guys uh now there's always been rumors going around and i wish these rumors were were definitely true about a goonies too you know mm-hmm. you know and then you guys on your website the goonies dot org uh, uh revealed like a, a cartoon like they were going to make a cartoon uh, of the goonies or something like that what's that right. about um yeah do you want me to yeah, uh, yeah whatever okay well yeah, The Goonies 2 is something that was kind of in secret um, starting, not really production, but some initial plans uh, a couple of years ago um, with actually Steven Spielberg and Richard Donner and oh, sure. I think the writers for the X-Men, right, the first X-Men movie, um, and they were all kind of getting together, getting some scripts together and to present it to Warner Brothers to see if it would go forward. Oh, sure. And, um, you know, with those heavy hitters all together, you know, Warner Brothers still decided that it was something that it didn't want to do. So that kind of shot that down. You know, if you have Steven Spielberg come to you, yeah. your project, you don't do it, you know, yeah. probably not going to happen. Um, and then they went the route of doing a cartoon. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, through some different uh, things that we've heard kind of possibly didn't work out. So it seems like our documentary might be the next actual Goonies thing on the horizon. Yeah, which is, yeah. Exciting and scary at the same time because I know there's a lot of people out there who are, you know, just dying for some yep. new Goonies. Yep. So huh. yeah, that's that's kind of uh, you know what we've known about that. We have we weren't able to talk about it for a long time. So oh yeah. Oh, kind wow. of fun now. You know, too bad it's obviously something that's not going to happen. But you know, at least we can kind of openly talk about it. Did now. they ever uh, release like what the uh, like say if they would have went along with it? Did they ever release what the uh, the storyline would be or what the story would happen to or what story would take place like? They were kicking around some ideas. I think, like, there's kind of the whole perspective of they don't want to just make another kids' movie. Yeah. Um, and they wanted to, unless they could capture the essence of the Goonies, they didn't really want to do it. Yeah. If they felt like they had some ideas that might be able to do that. And they did talk about them a bit. I'm not sure. I mean, I know we're talking about that a bit in our movie. I don't know. Uh, well, they level. talked about one of the things was if the Goonies had kids. Yeah. Uh, actually, I think it came back to Data, where he had a group of kids. Yeah. Um, that all knew of the Goonies as the Gloonies, which kind of was like an Asian... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and somehow, some way, they all get back together, and all the kids get to be with the actual Goonies, and I think that was part of the plot of... I mean, because really, you know, after all this time, how do you get all those people back together for oh, an sure. adventure? Oh, and that's sure. kind of the problem, because every, all the, the massive Goonies fan base, all kind of, they wanted the original cast in there. Yeah. It does not necessarily really make sense for a kid's adventure to pull that many yeah. uh, right. adults in it. I think that was one of the struggles they were probably having. Mm-hmm. Well, it's just uh, like if they were made like a Back to the Future Part 4 or if they were made a Terminator 4 or some movie like a Ghostbusters 3, you want the original cast in there because yeah. even though the story may be different and the whole life may be different now compared to them, but, you know, you, you want the original cast. That's a, that's what kind of makes it complete because you don't want, you know, a, a BS job. You know, you, you, you want something that's perfect or, well, not totally perfect, but just something that will work and Right, and something that kind of works with your nostalgic feelings and the things that you've built up as a kid, you know. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the things that was so exciting is because if, I mean, a lot of people don't pull off sequels, but I think yeah. Donner has been able to do that with you know, the 
lethal weapons. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, that ability to, to keep a story alive like that is something that he's been very good at. So oh, sure. It's going to be kind of exciting, but it looks like, and they pushed pretty hard. Donner's company was really, really trying to get this to happen, and, and Warner Brothers just didn't want to move on it. So. Right. That's and it's probably particularly um, kind of a bummer for Patrick and I because Richard Donner told us that if we did, or if they did do Goonies 2, that him and I would be in it. So oh, oh. there goes our <laughs> there goes our screen time. So <laughs> well, I tell you what, you know, you you know what you guys could do, you know, with I don't know if you guys have uh, messed around with this idea or not, but you know, since you guys are, are doing an independent film or, or an independent documentary, you know, you can always go the, the Sundance route or something like that, and, and maybe that will kind of say, wait a minute here, This is these guys are really, they, they made a documentary, why don't we think about doing something like this, you know, why don't we, you know, think about doing a Goonies 2 or something like that, or, or maybe pass around the idea again, because, right. you know, but what, have you guys ever thought about doing like a Sundance routine with your documentary once it finishes, or have no yeah, idea? So we're not quite sure yet if we're going to go for distribution, if we're going to go for more film festivals or distribute it ourselves, yeah. and we know that we have a pretty big fan base, and, um, you know, and we can kind of launch that direction if we want to. Oh, so sure. we're, we're, we're kind of trying to figure everything out and also trying to make sure that we, we stay on good legal standing. So. Right. Oh, yeah. And we're kind of learning as we go. I mean, one of the things that Richard Donner has said and most of the people we've interviewed have said is that, you know, obviously this documentary can only do good things for the Goonies because the more that it can show that there is a large fan base out there and that people really do want it, you know, to show yeah. Warner Brothers, obviously, yeah. that, you know, maybe it can open some doors for that. So, you know, who knows? You know, yeah. I mean, obviously there's tons of sequels uh, floating around, you know, like uh, Dukes of Hazard and oh, yeah. things like that. So, you know, there's, there's never say never, I guess. Oh, you know, who knows? Maybe one day they'll make the Goonies the TV show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, you never know. But I but I hope they never do, like, you know, because, you know, like, way back, like, okay, Gilligan's Island, you know, after it went off the air about, like, now our time, like a couple of years ago, they made the the real Gilligan's Island like a reality show. Yeah. Don't 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 go reality because that that would just <laughs> suck, you know. That's just no, exactly. But uh, let's see, what was I going to say? Uh, now, uh, of all the characters that are in the Goonies, now I know you guys have a favorite. <laughs> now, who who would be your top favorite? And who would be your least favorite? If you have a least. <laughs> uh, I don't know about least favorite, but my personal top favorite is Chunk. Uh, right, mine as well. I think that. You know, we definitely like the comedic aspect of it. Oh, yeah. And, uh, man, he just, that kid was such a great actor, you know, and, um, you know, Jeff Cohen is a really, really great guy now. Yeah. Um, and funny still, but, man, he just, he had the perfect ingredients for, for that role. Yeah. Um, fact, you don't really think of him as, like, the lead actor in it, but really he does the majority of the acting on his own. I mean, yeah. Sean Astin's, you know, primarily in these group settings the whole time. And yeah, basically. He's pretty much flying solo I mean, with a couple adults around, but all the stuff with Chunk and uh, and Sloth, it's pretty much Chunk carrying all the scenes. And, and for, like, a kid to be able to pull off that level of comedy <laughs> is just amazing. Yeah. Right. I mean, the only story I guess I could say with respect to the person, of course, is um, not that he was not my least favorite character, but um, Corey Feldman, you know. Oh, yeah. I've well, heard a few yeah. uh, stories about him that might not have been good, but when we got, went to meet him, he was just such a great guy and um, just so responsive to all our questions and so into the project and um, just a really great guy. And, oh, sure. you know, I think that, you know, maybe some of the negative things yeah. that I've heard about him, you know, are kind of kind of unwarranted. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. We had a really great time with him. Well, you know, a lot of people like to blow things out of proportion, you know. Like, what? Like okay, like, you know, I got a chance to, you know, my first every interview, I got a chance to, to do it with uh, Greg the Hammer Valentine. I don't know if you guys follow professional wrestling or not, but... Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, we know uh, who that is. Yeah, I mean, he, you know, he, he, you know, he's a uh, Mr. Controversial too sometimes. But then once you, you know, and this is somebody, you know, like you guys uh, idolize the Goonies. Well, this is kind of somebody that I idolized growing up as a kid. You know, now I'm only like 23 years old, so I idolize him, you know, a lot. You know, as far as being a wrestling fan, when I got a chance to interview him in the hotel room, just him and I, you know, I could see the chemistry building. You know, it's like, you know, sure you have you're Mr. Controversial sometimes, but yet. We're here doing an interview. You seem perfectly fine with me, you know? Right. Yeah, and that's the thing about all these cast members is the level of personality that these people have is just, it, it's extraordinary. And mm -hmm. and they all have it. It's, I mean, they're all different, but it's like there's just, there's so much to them that, yeah, you know, like, you know, I mean, they're passionate all the time. And mm -hmm. that sometimes, you know, can, can be offensive depending on what the passion's about. But, right, sure. Um, but it's just, I mean, they're all kind of so, so unique and so mm -hmm. diverse, but, but everyone's been just, it's really pleasant to work. Mm -hmm. 
Oh yeah, I mean it, it's uh, it's very it's very cool, you know, to to be able to <clears throat> to to do this and uh, and just like I, you know, like I was saying too about you know not just radio interviews or whatever, just to be able to talk to people that I never thought I'd ever dream of talking about, you know. Oh uh, yeah, exactly. That's the biggest thing. I mean, yeah, you because know, when we're doing it, obviously we're you know being as professional as we can, and you okay. know we're running it and setting up lights and doing all the things that we need to do, and then settle the mood down and do a, an interview, you know, but. It's funny, there's that little kid inside of me deep down that when I'm interviewing someone thinking like, wow, here's this character that I've looked at and liked my entire life, yeah. and here I am directly talking with them, you know, asking them questions and yeah, yeah. joking around, and that's that's pretty fun, you know. Oh, that that definitely is. Now, now you, guys, you guys have chatted with just about everybody on the Goonie roster except Martha Plimpton. Now, yeah. that's just because she lives in New York, or? She's Martha's not... been hard to get a hold of. Um, we tried to originally, I think, to go through her... Yeah, we used, yeah, and you know, sometimes you know the the latest information that out there isn't actually the latest, so it takes a few people saying, "Oh, now call this person, call this person, call that person." Yeah. You know, and you always hit them at different times and different schedules. Um, actually, the hardest people to get a hold of have been um, Jonathan Kiquan, who played Data. Yeah. And Kerry Green, um, who of course was the Andy. Andy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think they both lead more private lives, and that's something we were kind of told in the beginning that that those might be the harder people to get a hold of than they have been. Yeah, um, and I think Jonathan, it's not that he doesn't know about the project, it's just that he does like to be more private. Right, and so those, the last two are the people that we're probably going to, um, you know, once we kind of get a trailer together, um, we're going to send it through um, Jeff Cohen, since he still keeps up with them, oh, you know, yeah. to, to talk with them about it and see if it's something they want to do. And, you know, hopefully it would be really fun to meet them. Uh, obviously, we want to respect their privacy. Oh, uh, sure. But, you know, there's Steven. <laughs> oh, yeah, and there's Steven Spielberg, of course. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he's pretty receptive. He's just extraordinarily busy. So. Right. Yeah. It's really weird the, the, the things you kind of have to deal with and the queue you have to wait in, you know, to talk with him and, oh, and yeah. stuff like that. And So, I mean, it's something we're, we're still ongoing and pursuing. But, you know, hopefully that will work out as well. Now, uh, uh, now... You know, when we look back at the movie The Goonies and whatnot, and when we talk about it, we always talk bring up the great memories. Just think that the storyline of that original movie was different. You know, have you ever kind of wondered what, what like, you know, thought about it, like, uh, after you see it, like, a few times, you wonder, what if that movie would have been different? What if it would have had a different cast? Like a bunch of no neighbors will say, you know? Mm-hmm. Or what if it would have went, like, independent instead of, like, uh, you know, like, nationwide or whatever? Sure. You ever think about that at all, or sometimes, or... Or are you just uh, to say, well, gee, we're you know we're watching this movie, we know what's going to happen. It's just a great movie. It can't not ever be changed ever. You know what I'm getting at? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know that I've thought through it too much like that. And we have kind of, I mean, kind of in the pursuit of what could have happened. There's a lot of stuff in the movie that, like, you know, stuff that that was shot and didn't get the direction that didn't go. So you kind of do go some down some yeah. of those channels, and it would be a totally different movie mm-hmm. if some of those things had played out. But yeah. um, I haven't really thought about it too much from a Right, and I mean, I, you, Patrick's right. We've gotten this. We've gotten a hold of the storyboard of what what most of the storyboard is that's left. And yeah. Kind of saw a few other avenues that went down, and it would have been a little bit different of a movie. Um, you know, maybe a few things that would have lost people's interest. But I mean, I don't know. For me, the biggest part besides the adventure is when they're just hanging out in the house, you know, joking around, you know, yeah. eating chips and you know, breaking the David statue. For some reason, yeah. that's the part to me that really hits home because it makes me think of being a kid and yeah. doing all those things. And so it had enough of the regular elements besides the adventure. That oh, really sure. Happened. Now, now w- when you guys went to that house, did you actually get, inside, uh, get a chance to go inside there at all and, and see some of the spots that they use, or, or how'd that go? Yeah, we've been inside the house. Uh, we've seen all that. The, the owner of the house is kind of a friend of ours now, and, and she's shown us through everything. Um, we actually went up in the attic. It's not the same attic in the movie, but okay. same stairs. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and we've been inside the jail. Okay, yeah, I saw that. I remember seeing that on your video. Yeah. The jail's interesting because they use that jail to hold um, evidence Evidence now. And so okay. it's full of guns. And there's even like a turret, like a gun on a turret in there and all this weird stuff. And so they had to, you know, clear the cell out for us. They yeah. had to have one police officer watching every single thing we did the whole time, which was weird. Check, our, check the shots of the video. And yeah, oh, it was yeah. weird. We uh, weren't allowed to shoot any of the other stuff. Um but that was really nice of the city of Astoria to do that for us, and I think they've been really um, supportive of us huh. um, since they, of course, love the Goonies as well. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, uh, and then we've okay. also been, uh, well, I guess we haven't really been on it, 
so we saw the, the model of the ship. Yeah. Which was, oh, wow. Which was done in amazing detail. And, uh, and then what else have we been? It's the only, yeah. Uh, Willie. <laughs> oh, yeah, we got to see uh, one of Willie's head, which is in Richard Donner's office. Oh, jeez. Which was really fun. And the shots of the sound stages and things like Just, that. But, yeah, and, um, but I think being at the Goonies' house, I think, was one of the most exciting parts because it's relatively similar to what it was back then. Oh, um, sure, so yeah. that feels pretty magical. You know, you're like, holy cow, this is, you know, there's Data's house, and I can look out the window and see all the stuff that you could see in the movie, and um, that, that was really interesting for us. I think I remember the first time just standing on the um, porch, I was like, holy cow, yeah. you're at the actual Goonies' house, you know? <laughs> so that funny was really fun. The story is such a small town Yeah. I, I, that when you drive through it, I mean, within about a, what, two miles or something, right. you've pretty much gone through the, you know, everything that's in the Goonies. It's not like they staged it all, just... That is that town. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's like the, everything from the little corner cafe yep. to the... To the jail, to the, the museum. museum, to the house. It's all, you know, really, if you were a kid there, you really would ride your bike around all the time. Oh, yeah, day. definitely, definitely. It's one of those towns, you know, even though I don't know how, how much there is for business-wise, but you know, or if there's really a lot to do, but it would be one of those towns that I definitely know I would have my own adventure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, and it, that was... That's been kind of the, one of the funner parts, too, is being able to see those things and, yeah. you know, get access to things that a lot of people don't get access to. And, um, you know, it's really just because everyone loves that movie. Yeah. And that's kind of what's done it for us. Well, it seems like, you know, a lot of times a, a story doesn't get the recognition like it should. Like, you know, like nowadays you don't really hear a whole lot, like, in the media or in the news about, about a town like that. It's kind of like, you know, it's like they want to let it fade away or something like that, you know? Right, it's definitely sort of a sleepy town in that respect. Yeah. You know, I guess it's true nothing really big happens there. But it's for a fishing town primarily. Right. Yeah. Like it was, I don't know if it I, still I would is. think, yeah. But, I mean, I guess, truthfully, compared to a lot of regular old towns, a lot of stuff does happen there, at least with the movies. Oh, sure, sure. Not close to anything. It's like, you know, two hours to Portland, the closest real city. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, you know, you're either driving straight there or flying into Portland and then driving to there. So. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Well, you know, I, we're almost out of time, and I really appreciate you guys' uh, time or let me interview you and whatnot. And, uh, you know, if, if you could ever help me out in the future with interviews or, or let people know about me on your website or, or something like that, or you know, I really appreciate that. And uh, I'm going to ask you guys to do one last thing. Uh, uh, what I <clears throat> I don't know, do you guys ever get a chance to listen to any of the interviews that I did on my MySpace page at all? Uh, yeah, I've listened to actually, uh, you know, parts of a few of them just to familiarize myself with okay. your show. <clears throat> you, you, you know how I kind of uh, close the show, kind of? Oh, no, I don't think I've heard that. Okay. How I normally close the show is because uh, I'm trying to bring back the old ways of radio. You know, mm -hmm. Most people don't do this anymore, but uh, uh, some some stations still do. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to say uh, what, what I want you guys to do is say who you are, who you're listening to, and what station you're listening to. So maybe I'll help you out. I'll help you out a little bit. Yeah, let, let, I don't want to get this wrong, so let me okay. make darn sure that we say this okay. right. Okay. Uh, this isn't live. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's why I do pre-record, man. That's why I do it. But, yeah, it's, uh, it's like those people who win things on a on a radio show. Yeah. And then they say, who's the station that, you know, did that for you? And you can't remember because yeah. you're so excited. Or you say a different station. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, uh, no, uh, well, let's see you. Well, and then that's kind of why we don't really do live interviews because sometimes we don't know what the person's going to say. You know? Oh, exactly. Yeah, be, you know. It can be a uh, swear fest up and down, so right. can't have exactly. that. Exactly. Okay. Let's see here. Now, now I have your um, <clears throat> okay. in here. Now, uh, uh, Thank you, Slauson, from... Um, Pioneer 94.1. Yeah, 91. Or, or 90.1 FM. Let me yeah. put that in a <laughs> document here. So okay, we, cool. And uh, like I said, you, you know, it's really cool... You know, have you guys ever been up to Minnesota at all? Ever? Uh, I might have been through Minnesota. Okay. Uh, uh, once or twice. I think I just flown through it. Yeah. Never been up up in the Great White North though, I suppose. <laughs> Never in northern Minnesota, I don't think. No, probably not. Yeah. Is that where you're located? Yeah, that's where we're located. <laughs> we're kind of in a small little town too, or uh, well, I mean, I don't consider this a uh, steep river small, but it's a uh, we got like over eight thousand people, so. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> so, um. Yeah, if we had more time, I probably would have put in a plug for uh, our website. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. I forgot to ask you about that. I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's, okay. it's the, the community there in our message board, which kind of drives the whole thing, you know. Yeah. I, I might not be on there for a long time, but, you know, it's constantly growing and constantly people on there. And oh, sure. Really, 
that's you know that's kind of really the heart and soul of the Goonies fans. Okay. Um, the Goonies dot org is how people can get a hold of you and oxygenproductions dot com, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's cool. I love. Uh, anyway, well, I like I said, I do appreciate you guys. Uh, let me talk to you. That's really it's a it's a cool deal. I hope one day maybe in the future we get to meet. You know. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that would be exciting. Uh, so anyway, I don't worry. You know, since this is pre-recorded, I you know I'll I'll do some editing later. So. Oh sure. Yeah. Well, we have it written down. Frank is lost in uh, ninety point one FM. <clears throat> okay. So you guys kind of know now, kind of how the drill goes. You say who you are, and, yeah. and maybe say your company or what you represent or whatever, and then uh, go just go with that. Right. Are you guys ready then? Yep. All right. Okay, this is Ron Fugelseth. And Pat Radcliffe from thegoonies.org. And oxygenproductions.com. And you're listening to Frankie Slauson from Pioneer 90.1 FM. All right, cool. I really appreciate this. And uh, uh, don't forget to check out my show uh, Tuesday nights, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. I got a two-hour show now. And it's going to be my two-year anniversary on the radio. So. All right, congratulations, Frankie. All right, yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> and we'll talk to you guys later. All right, bye. All right, thanks. Bye. Bye. <laughs>
with a show for the for the World's Fair, and it was called the Black Hawk Gunfighters or something. And we put on these skips uh, at the Texas Pavilion, and, and that was really my start. And then after that, I, I came home and was uh, allowed to join the Screen Extras Guild. And then after that, shortly after joining that, I was offered a chance to fall off my horse, and that, that made me join the Screen Actors Guild. And, so, <laughs> and then I worked both cards what we called it in those days, work both cards. I worked extra when I needed to pay the bills and took a stunt job when I could get it. Oh, sure. And uh, then I got good jobs working stunts. A uh, good friend of my brother's and my family, Everett Creech, who has since passed away, uh, gave me a chance to go to Mexico on a good job, uh, dubbing uh, Peter Strauss. Okay. And uh, after that, I didn't work extra anymore. I just started doing all stunt work and eventually phased phased into uh, coordinating uh, companies having uh, confidence in me and, and producers and directors uh, liking the way I worked, and I was able to become a coordinator. Okay. And I did both, and then I phased into uh, doing second unit directing and joined the Directors Guild in about 1987, I think. And uh, basically just filled it out doing that kind of stuff, working along uh, one of the crew members. Uh, until about 1995 when I moved up here. And uh, I moved, to, like I said, moved to Bemidji in 95 and worked a few shows, coordinated a few shows after that. Uh, I'd leave here on, in the winter time and I went and did a few shows for some friends. And uh, uh, there was a Bruce Willis show I, I worked on, uh, Breakfast of Champions, which not a lot of people saw. <laughs> was, I worked a lot for a director named Alan Rudolph. And uh, I think the last show I actually did as a coordinator was in 2000 or 2002. I have to look at my records, but it was uh, for Bill Paxton, uh, a show called Frailty. Okay. Uh, it was a pretty interesting project. And uh, since then, I've been just knocking around. I, I told you earlier, we owned the Bemidji Speedway for about seven years. Yes. And we owned it, we operated it for five, and uh, then we decided to phase that out of our life and, and moved on. And now I'm kind of going back to my roots. I, I grew up around the rodeos. Oh, yes. And uh, was a bull rider before I started doing stunt work. And, uh, well, I guess now that I'm kind of semi-retired, uh, the passion for the rodeo life has come back again, and I'm now getting involved in uh, the raising of uh, bucket bulls and uh, getting involved with some of the breeders and people that are in that business. And I'm... Uh, hooked up with a friend of mine, not to be so long-winded, but just to give you a little bit of what's going on, I'm hooked up right now with a friend of mine named Mike Porter that uh, has a website called rodeostockyard.com, which is an online auction uh, website for rodeo stock and rodeo equipment. And I'm kind of a uh, secondary administrator for him when he needs a little help. He set me up so I can go in and, and help him when he's out of town, and, and uh, that's kind of what I've been doing the last uh, year or so. Well, that's, that's interesting. It, it's nice to know that you, you, you like to keep yourself uh, very busy and whatnot. Very busy with the uh, little, whether it be with stunt coordinating or being the rodeo or just race car driving or, or just whatever, you know, whatever interests you. I did look at your website, and obviously that's how I met you. But uh, I also understand that you're really into, like, nature and wildlife, and that's why you kind of picked... Uh, North, northern Minnesota or Bemidji or where you live right now uh, as a uh, place to live because it's so beautiful around there. That's very true and it, it, it uh, fell in, it kind of fell into our lap. My wife is a wildlife artist, uh, a very wonderful painter. I'm a little prejudiced but yeah. I can say that without any uh, remorse. She, she's a beautiful painter. I don't know if you got a chance to check her. Yeah, out. yes I, I did. I had a link to hers. And uh, I came here specifically to uh, look at and buy the racetrack here. And, and when we got settled and realized what a beautiful spot and wildlife uh, area it is and how much habitat there was here, uh, it just fit right in. And so when we decided not to do the racetrack anymore, we did stay here in northern Minnesota because of that. Oh, yeah. So my wife is uh, working diligently, uh, doing her wildlife artwork, and she still does some Western art. Actually, she's gotten started just recently uh, doing portraits of, of uh, bucket bulls and rodeo stock, which has been real popular. <laughs> you know, they want a portrait of their favorite bucket bull before they pass away or something. Yeah. It's been real, it's been real good. But she works real hard, too. She's uh, 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 vice president and, and chairman of the membership.
leadership of uh, a group called the Women Artists of the West, which is now, it, it was based on the West Coast, but now it's all over the United States and Canada, and uh, so that keeps us both busy. I help her, and she helps me. Well, that's, that's kind of nice, a uh, nice team effort, you know, that you guys got. And yeah, I did go to her website, too, and uh, it's, it's she, she is very talented. She is very good. I'm very... She got uh, pictures out of there that, I, you know, that you would think that were just photos just taken, but they're so real, realistic that, wow. Yeah. yeah, that's very true. She is a realist. Uh, some people enjoy that, that, that type of work. Uh, we do. Uh, we, there, we know there's all kinds of different uh, uh, attitudes and, and, and personal tastes, but we particularly like the, uh, the uh, realist work. And uh, you can reach, if anybody's interested out there, they can go to her website at lindawalkerart.com. It's real easy to find. And just take a look. She does some really beautiful stuff. And uh, does she uh, sell anything online at all? Or? Yeah, yes, she does. Uh, uh, there are there are some prices there and, and processes and PayPal and all the regular Internet stuff. It, it's all there. Uh, she does do, she's getting back into doing more shows, uh, personal appearances and shows and stuff. Actually, she just got home. She spent the whole month of November in California and Hawaii doing art show out there. Oh, wow. And uh, so I finally got her home here and uh, trying to get her back to work. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's interesting. And, and now, now with, you, with you now, with your, your outstanding career, uh, your 40-some career, uh, your career uh, just being in the entertainment industry, uh, I noticed here that you were, of course you've been at some TV shows. Obviously, uh, you were in Kung Fu, and you were in the uh, well. You were in the uh, about three or four episodes of that about or Kung, Kung Fu. Yeah, actually, uh, I was the coordinator on. The, now this is the original in the early seventies. Yeah, uh, they they went on and did an additional show here a, lot, a few years ago called The Legend of Kung Fu, using David Carradine also. But I went in and I worked on the original uh, TV series uh, in nineteen. 72 through 74, we did like three seasons. Okay. Uh, so I worked on all but, I'd say, three episodes of that. They had done a two-hour uh, pilot and two one-hour. And then when they very first started that, they started it out doing one-hour segments and would show it once a month, and they interchanged it with three other uh, show ideas. It was a strange concept in those days. And I had seen it and thought, boy, that's the weirdest show I've ever seen. And it turned out that the, po the popularity of it and the, uh, the uh, audience uh, demand, they wanted to see more of it. Uh, they started a weekly TV series. Uh -huh. Well, it turned out that a, a good friend of mine that was the first assistant on a show I did in Mexico, which was The Wrath of God, uh, was the director, uh, Ralph Nelson. And I was working for Edward Creek. Well, he got the job, and, and the director, which was the producer also of Jerry Thorpe, asked him, uh, who can we get the double David Carradine for the TV series? He says, I got a guy for you. And they called me in, I got the interview, and uh, basically was there for three years. Uh, okay. It was a wonderful opportunity for me. It, it actually springboarded my career into being a coordinator. Uh, in those days, uh, Warner Brothers didn't, I can't get into the legalities of why yeah. they do things, but they basically didn't give stunt coordinators a screen credit. So I negotiated the second season into a, to a, a screen credit called uh, Stunt Liaison, which, okay. is what a, which is what a coordinator is. Yeah. But uh, so I got Stunt Liaison credits on that for two years, and uh, that it was a wonderful experience. I knew nothing about martial arts, and, and I learned it for the TV, and I met some really great people. I've met a lot of great actors, and it just kind of snowballed into, uh, well, I went on doing stunt work after that, just working for other guys, but it gave me credits where I could go in and, and have confidence to uh, ask people to let me be their stunt work. Oh, sure. So that, that show was really good for me, and uh, uh, David was, was very interesting in those days uh, uh, to work with, uh, and he's still around. David's looking real good now. He's, he's uh, I see him every once in a while, so. Huh. Any, any other ones you got in mind? <laughs> well, you know, uh, that's uh, that's where my next question was going to lead to. Uh, of all the actors or actresses that you worked with uh, throughout your stunt coordinated career, or just you know through all the films that you've been in, uh, what what who was your favorite to work with? It can be male or female. Boy, that's tough because there's so many good guys, so many good. Because there, there's a few bad eggs in every basket. Yeah. Of it, but there were some really good people. Uh, Peter Strauss, I, I worked at Double Peter Strauss. I don't know if you remember him. He did a lot of TV stuff. If you saw his face, you know exactly who Peter Strauss. Yeah. Uh, but I, I did Double Peter for, well, he was the, actually the, uh, the star of uh, Soldier Blue, was the name of the first large uh, feature that I went to Mexico to 
is, you know, just because, you know, you have worked with so many. How about Dick Warlock? Because I know you guys are, you know, even when he started his interview last week, that you guys are pretty good friends. We, we, we have known each other a long time. Uh, Dick was a, great, a very good stuff man and a, and a good actor. And, yeah. I, and I was put in a position where I would be able to, to uh, ask him to work for me. And I put him in the spots where he did a lot of acting for me. Uh, so we did together, uh, which was a Bicycle Messenger movie. The, uh, oh boy, I can't remember all these titles either. But uh, <laughs> Dick was really good. Uh, yeah. You interviewed Mickey Jones. Yes, I did. Me and Mickey go way back. We worked extra together back in the old Daniel Boone days. My, <laughs> dad, was, my dad was a stand-in for Fess Parker on Daniel Boone and, and helped me get into the business. Well, I met Mickey uh, working on Daniel Boone, and, and he was a drummer at the time working clubs in the Southern, Southern California area, and he was just a, a great guy. And we've been friends ever since. And, and since I heard your interview with him, I actually contacted him through email, and, and we're, we're back talking again. Glad I can make that happen for you. <laughs> oh, I appreciate it. It really was fun. I mean, I, I, uh, we get Christmas cards. We yeah. change Christmas cards, but do we ever really take the time to sit down and talk to each other? Not very often. Yeah. We both would like to see each other, but uh, we're gotta say we're quite a ways from uh, yeah right now. So. Well, you know, I mean, that, who knows? That could always be arranged. And, and trust me, if, if Mickey Jones ever came down and visited with you, you'd have to let me know because I, <laughs> I would have to love to meet him just as I love to meet you as well. And, you know, and, and all the people that I've interviewed, you know, it's just, it's such a, as I was telling you yesterday in our pre-conversation, you know, it's just so amazing, you know, with, they always said, you know, with radio, you were, you were going to meet or talk to people you never thought you'd ever had a chance to, you know, can't do that anywhere, can't do that anywhere else. Well, and there's also the same type of uh, quotes about the motion picture industry, uh, and I have to say that it has uh, been a very, very exciting and interesting life for me. I love to travel, yeah. and that had a lot to do with why I uh, went out and tried to find feature, uh, work on feature films more than locally on TV in Los Angeles, because I wanted to travel. Oh, sure. It took me to places that I would have never, ever dreamed of going. Uh, I got to go into places that, that the general public is never allowed to go, okay. just because we were going to shoot a movie there, you know? Yeah. Uh, my introduction to Minnesota was through the motion pictures. Yeah. Uh, my first introduction to Minnesota was was uh, working on a film in St. Cloud. Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine, George Fisher, was doing a, a small, low-budget film up there for a guy that was uh, raised in Minnesota, raised in St. Cloud, and uh, basically um, hadn't done anything. He was basically fresh, just out of film school, and and was making a film called Catch Me If You Can. Okay. And his name is Stephen Summers. Now, now, is that anywhere? Like the, the movie, Catch Me If You Can? Not the newest one that's been out okay. about the uh, traveling uh, con man. Yeah. This is this was a, this was a film, it, still, it was called the same thing, and it's the only instance that I know of them ever actually making another film without it being a remake. Yeah. But this was with Matt Latanzi and produced and directed by Stephen Summers. And Stephen Summers was just a young kid at that time. Yeah. And I came up and I worked on the film and I actually did a part in it called The Widowmaker, which I was a, uh, a hired gun to come in. It was, a, it was about kids racing cars on the street. That's yeah. what it was. I don't know if you ever saw that show. Nope. People I around St. Cloud so. sure know about it. <laughs> I'm kind of notorious down there for being the Widowmaker. Yeah. Uh, I was hired by the bad guy in the movie to come in and race him and run him off the road and try to keep him from succeeding at his goals. You have to see the movie to know what I'm talking yeah. about, but it was a lot of fun. And, and I got to uh, do a lot of car stuff on that, but I also got to do a pretty good part in it as the Widowmaker, and it was uh, pretty interesting, but it introduced me to people in Minnesota, and after that, I I uh, was gone for a few years, then I came back and did another show in Minneapolis for Alan Rudolph, which was Equinox. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of that one. Uh, I don't think so. so uh, there's a lot I haven't seen yet. <laughs> it was, well, and there a few years ago, yeah. so I have to, you know, I apologize that I don't have a lot of new credit for you guys. <laughs> uh, this was a Matthew Modine show right there okay. in the Equinox, uh, Equinox within in Minneapolis. Yep. They didn't call it Minneapolis, they just called it something else weird. Empire City or something. Yeah. And Alan was always just on the verge of being futuristic weird. And uh, it was Matthew Modine and Laura, Vin Laura Glenn Boyle was the name. Okay. Of but there was some really great guys in that. Uh, uh, O'Connor, uh, oh, I thought of his name ask me about good guys or not, this kid was really a good guy. <laughs> but I got to I got to work in, in Minneapolis and uh, I said, Well I'm gonna call my friends in St. Cloud.
out and go up and take a visit because I had seen him in a few years. He was a man that was Christ, who was actually a, a, a max racer and a racing family. But he had been hired on. So how these how these stories go round and around. Buzz had been hired locally to help build the dunk car. Okay. So I got to know him because we were doing car chases, and my friend Rick Stevens, who's a, a well-known stunt car driver and teacher, uh, did a great car jump in it where he jumped a 57 Chevy over like a six and a half foot fence almost through the goalpost <laughs> in the high school. And uh, so we got to know Buzz, and uh, I came back up to visit Buzz when I was here on Equinox. And, uh, oh, long story, to make a long story short, he said, why don't you buy a racetrack and get into the racing business? Uh, I got to thinking about it. A few years went by. I shopped racetracks. They called me one time and said, you know, there's a place called the Vichy Manitoba that has a racetrack for sale. I was thinking about it. I came up here. It was right at the time I was working on you mentioned Kansas City yeah. uh, for Robert Altman in Kansas City. So I came up from there and uh, made the deal and we decided to make the move and so here I am in Minnesota. Without the motion picture business, I would have never yeah. thought about coming to Minnesota. Yeah. Well, that was a, it was a, a well-kept secret. Well, you do like it around the area, I'm sure. And I it's like we mentioned already, and, you know, and like I said, you know, you know, I've been trying to get hooked up with some of these people, and, and I know you, you were mentioned to me, and maybe this would be good publicity for you, uh, a little early probably, but uh, you're talking about doing a documentary on bull real pay or something like that? Or bull riding? Uh, the bull breeding business, yep. where they're breeding these bulls and, and uh, for the rodeo and for bull riding. Everybody's familiar now with the PBR on TV. Yep. And so, yes, I was uh, saying I have a desire to put together a package and try to sell it somewhere that would include uh, basically the bull industry, the bucking bull industry. Uh, and I'm finding out the more I'm around here, there's a lot of it going on in, in the northern Midwest yeah. states that I gave credit to when I first thought about getting into this. Uh, even though the big bulk of the breeders and everything are in Oklahoma and Texas yeah. and all down in there. My friend, uh, Mike Porter, who has the RodeoStockJart.com, mm -hmm. uh, he's in South Carolina. Okay. So the business, and, you know, it's like computers have opened the world to everybody. It's, yeah. it's made the world very small. Yeah. So... Uh, I would like to be able to do what I love and still be involved in a craft that I'm very uh, aware of, I mean, you know, educated in, yeah. which is producing and basically uh, on set working. And it's, it's just, it's just a, 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 a lifestyle that you can't get out of your blood. Yeah. Uh, the rodeo is one that, that is resurfacing now, uh, but uh, production and being involved in film in any form, any any form of the of the art, uh, is still in the blood and I, I just feel lost without being involved. Oh sure. Uh, as you asked me asked you earlier, you know, when did I get started performing? I basically got started performing when I first learned to walk. My dad was making a, a movie, uh, not necessarily anything that was published or produced or, or anything, but he was making movies and I was working those and then he was a rodeo announcer, like I said, I was raised yeah. the rodeo. So I worked with the rodeo clowns, and when they did acts in front of the audience, I would do silly things like run out and let the dog pull my pants off. <laughs> so I've been working in front of audiences and crowds almost as long as I could walk. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, I try to keep busy, but it's awful hard to get that out of your blood. I can't just sit here and watch TV. Yeah. Old, you know. <laughs> Getting old, you can't stop, but you don't have to just sit and vegetate. Yeah, that's true. Well, I, I tell you what, I, I do appreciate the fact that you uh, are on, and uh, we're almost out of time. But, okay. Uh, uh, one thing that I want to do, well, first of all, thank you, first of all, for uh, letting me interview you. I, I think, uh, well, just like I said, and I know this for a fact, that you know that, that you and I will have a chance to meet here soon. And, uh, you know, since you're not that far away, you know. That, you can count on it. Uh, whether you want to or not, you're going to have to put up with me. I'm going to come and visit. I want to see your community, and uh, we will talk some more. Yeah, we, we, and you know what? And like I said, if there's any way that I can help you with live, live your dream as far as the, the, the bull rope and bull riding uh, experience or documentary that you want to do, as I told you before, I would be a huge, a perfect host for a documentary because I, I, I think in the future, I think that's what I'd be good at, you know. Well, we will discuss that. <laughs> we can definitely work on it. Okay. And the uh, last thing I want you to do is uh, what I told you yesterday is give me a, a legal ID. You got it. Um, okay, this is Greg Walker. You're listening to Frankie Swanson. Stop. Can we do a take two? Yeah, it's Frankie Swanson. Swanson, I got it right. Yeah. I can't read it. That's okay. That's okay. All right. Hi, this is Greg Walker. You're listening to, to Frankie Swanson on Pioneer 90.1.
business and uh, we'll get together in business real soon. Frank. All right. Happy New Year, man. Thank you, my man. All right. Bye. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to say thank you for uh, tuning in to the up-and-coming episodes of my Best of Show. We're on episode number three right now, and my guest at this time is someone that I've been trying to get for quite a while, but finally things have worked out. <laughs> a legendary guy who was originally uh, the cowboy in the village people, I give you my friend Randy Jones. Welcome. Hey, Frankie and everybody. How y'all doing out there? Oh, it's it's going very well. Is it cold? <laughs> oh, <laughs> hell yes. <laughs> i tell you that much. What's the temperature out there? It's, it's, it's been chilly here in New York, too. Well, it's, uh, well, uh, probably not as chilly as it is in New York. Or, uh, well, it's probably more chillier in New York. It's, uh, right now it's like below seven. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, well, how do you guys live out there? Well, I think after years and years of uh, just being used to it, you know, it just kind of grows on you, you know? Yeah, well, I. Obviously, because um, I, and I've been <clears throat> now. You're you're in uh, Saint Saint Paul. Where? Is no, it? Uh, Thief River Falls, Minnesota. It's uh, northwestern Minnesota. It's northwest. Okay, because I have not been. I don't think I've been there. I've been to. Uh, I know I've been to Saint Paul and Minneapolis, and we went to a couple places in the north. But okay. I know it gets cold in the winter time. Oh yeah, that's uh, that's a definite. Uh, that's why we always look forward to like summertime and in spring and spring and everything. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so how how the heck are you? I'm I'm doing great. Um, I've got my new CD, uh, Ticket to the World, that's in pre-release. It comes out everywhere uh, the third week of January. Okay. And I'm currently performing in an off-Broadway show called. The Madonna Whore Confessions of a Dirty Mind. Okay. Um, it's running here in New York. Um, lots of things are going on. I'm just keep keep plugging, you know. Oh, uh, that's cool. And uh, well, uh, uh, well, thank you for taking the time to let me interview you. And uh, it should be a lot of fun. And uh, you know, since since uh, I've been waiting for you, I, I don't know if you ever go. Well, I know you have a MySpace page. Right? Oh yeah, I have MySpace, which is uh. MySpace.com backslash Randy Jones World. I have my official website, which is RandyJonesWorld.com, and you can find my CD right now on Apple iTunes and 20 or 30 other different uh, digital download services, as well as you can buy the physical CD from my website, website which is RandyJonesWorld.com, or CDBaby.com backslash Jones Randy. Okay, and. Uh, 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 now, uh, with you uh, beginning your career, what got you into uh, music and Broadway and all that? Oh, uh, well, let's see. Since a kid, I've been performing in in, in um, theater and in musicals. I attended um, University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill uh, and studied theater, communications, and film, and then I attended the North Carolina School of the Arts in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and studied uh, choreography and dance. Um, while I was doing uh, in Winston-Salem, I started working with a great American choreographer, Agnes DeMille, who was responsible for choreographing such musicals as um, Oklahoma, Carousel, Brigadoon, Paint Your Wagon, uh, and that, I worked with their dance company for several years. I moved to New York. I, um, continued to go out and tour in musical, musical theaters. Um, I've toured in all around the country from your part, your neck of the woods <laughs> to Indiana, Indiana uh, Michigan, all the Midwest, Kansas City, Indianapolis, all that area. Um, and uh, once I uh, got up here in, in Scotland, and living in New York, I came up here in 75. I met some wild ladies by the name of Grace Jones and Janice Dickinson and Jerry Hall, and we all were models and just ran around and were on the runways from New York to Milan to London to Paris and had some great times. And then Grace got a record deal, and I was one of the two guys that helped her create her original act. 
And from there, I um, the producers of I met the producers of Village People, and they asked me if I wanted to be in a group they were putting together, and I asked them, did it pay? And then I said yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and that's how it all started. Then we did Macho Man and yeah, and YMCA and in the Navy and a, a big movie called Can't Stop the Music, yeah. and it that was nearly 30 years ago. And, and uh, what was life like, you know, when touring with the village people and being a part of a, such a legendary group as that? Well, it, it, it was it, it was an incredible experience um, for someone in their um, 20s to have the experience of riding on the Concorde, which now doesn't even fly anymore, but riding on a plane that gets you from New York to Paris in just over three hours <laughs> um, and having carte blanche and first class everything, whether it's limousines, hotels, five-star hotels all around the world, and and the performing in just about <clears throat> every on every continent in just about every country, um, everything from um, oh I don't know I, I've done every, the experiences everything from performing for um, uh, outdoor shows of 280,000 people uh, like the Canada Jam, um, performing at the original Moulin Rouge in Paris. Command performance for the Queen of England. Um, not to mention being in that movie I mentioned, Can't Stop the Music, yeah. cost about thirty-five million dollars in nineteen seventy-nine dollars. To um, performing at an inaugural ball for our, our current president George Bush in two thousand five, yeah. after he was elected. Oh wow! So uh, I've, and and that was as a solo artist. So okay. I, I, my my career has spanned more than about 35 years and it is still going strong i mean like i said I, I get up every day and make sure i know my lines and show up at the theater for an eight o'clock curtain at night and portray a psychiatrist who's uh, deeply in need of psychiatry himself <laughs> in this play um the madonna whore and um when i'm not doing that when I have a day or two off, I go out and I do uh, shows on the weekends or on my days off, um, performing music from my new CD, Ticket to the World. Um, and when I get a minute, I call my friends in Minnesota and chat to them on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. So, I, you know, I'm just continuing keeping on. Well, that, uh, that's, that's cool. And uh, how I was able to get a hold of you if... If you're kind of wondering, I think you kind of already know, but just uh, to say it once again, uh, I uh, knew uh, Mike Massey, you know, Michael Massey. From, He's uh, down in Raleigh, right? Down in Raleigh. He does uh, Mikey's Adventure Show. And, uh, Which he, I've, I, you know, I've not been able to see it. Do you, have you seen tapes of it? Have you seen it? Uh, I've seen, I've seen uh, on the MySpace page, because uh, that's his, basically his official website. And right. it's all of ours, just about, besides the ones that have their own domain or whatever. Uh, he normally puts uh, up uh, clips of uh, stuff that he's done, not full length, like uh, actual TV shows, but uh, just little five minute clips here and there on what he does. And he just recently did some stuff at uh, Overtimes, which is a pub in Raleigh. Yeah. And uh, he did some stuff over there, and then he did some uh, uh, jousting or whatever. Uh, some yeah something like that in Raleigh and yeah so you'll have to check it out. Uh, well, now, uh, the, 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 do they do first of all? Um, have you been to Raleigh? No, I've never. <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest. I'm just a 23 year old kid that uh, hasn't really been around the world like you have yet. So yeah. Well, the, my interest in that is um, I'm that's my hometown. I was born yeah, and raised in. Yeah. I know that. I was born there. I went to high school there. I at Chapel Hill, the University of North Carolina, is only about 28 or 30 miles from there. So that's where I went to my first university, where I studied theater and communication. Yeah. So, and I, when I go back, I try to coordinate with Mike, but I haven't been able to to do a show yet. But I look forward to doing that when I'm down there again next month. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, you know, he he uh, he, he works pretty hard. I mean, he's uh, you know. How 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 we met, uh, which is kind of a funny story. Uh, we just uh, <clears throat> uh, through the MySpace deal. I, you know, besides you, I've done uh, 13 other interviews with people, and he was one of the people I interviewed. 
you know, we just kind of hit it off from there. Have not been to Raleigh yet. He has not been over here to Thief River yet, but uh, who knows, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Raleigh, Raleigh's a great town, and it's certainly grown tremendously. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I was in high school there. It's it's a it's a it's a booming big city now. It used to be a smaller capital town. That it's not a town anymore. It's a, it's a big city. It's got yeah. a lot of traffic. It's it's got it's a big place. A lot of people are moving there. Well, Raleigh gets a lot of business, and uh, it kind of, kind of reminds me of Thief River Falls. Well, Thief River Falls is way smaller than Raleigh, but. Uh, Raleigh probably is the size of Grand Forks, North Dakota, probably, and, uh, I don't know since I've never been there, but, uh, Thief River is a good sized town over here. We have everything you need, your Walmarts, your Target, or well, not your Targets, but your Kmarts and everything else. So. <laughs> but, uh, uh, more about you, uh, mm-hmm. now, uh, I understand, now, uh, throughout your, after you were done performing music, you know, uh, you, or taking a break or whatever, you, uh, did some acting and whatnot, you, uh, were in the, the Simpsons, you did a voiceover. Oh, yeah, we, we, uh, Simpsons, there's, yeah, I, well, I, I, I've actually, it's not like I've taken a break from, ever, ever really have taken a break from music. Um, okay. I've just had the, this, this career as a performer. First of all, I was trained as an actor to begin with. Yeah. And then I, uh, somehow I became, uh, well, as a young person, I trained as an actor, singer, dancer. I took all three. And, um, as an, as a performer, um, if you're, if you have, um, abilities in as many areas as possible, yeah. um, I think that benefits the performer. So if there, if someone wasn't, offering you a job to sing, then there was someone maybe offering a job to act, or then if there wasn't offering either of those two, maybe there was offering a job to dance. Yeah. And you're always lucky when it involves all three. Oh, yeah. So that's sort of um, I, I, wherever the gig is as I go. Okay. So that's probably why you saw, you, if you've been to my IMDB oh, yes, yes. on page, you yes, see that I've either... My voice, my face, or my uh, show up somewhere. Yep. In a, in a, whether it's The Simpsons, whether it's um, Married with Children, um, Periscope, where, whatever it is, <laughs> I'm, I'm some, there somewhere. There is a, a a couple films that should be out this this coming year. Um, one is called A Tale About Bootlegging, which mm-hmm. is about um, um, moonshiners in the 30s in oh, North, wow. North Carolina. And another one called Three Long Years, which is um, where I play this kind of um, off his, a little off his kilter nurse out in um, a little town called Athens, Ohio. Okay. And um, but uh, people can always keep up um, and keep abreast of what's going on with me at RandyJonesWorld.com. Yep. And um, you you can hear music there. You can see a video sampler of um, songs from Ticket to the World. And um, yeah, you know, have a good time. You know? Oh, it's it's it is a nice website. I, <clears throat> I gotta give you props on that because I I do uh, I, I like how you you got like. Well, so people have an idea of what your new album sounds like. Yeah. You, you got like a nice little five-minute video that yeah. kind of is a highlight, you know. I think yeah, that's cool. It's a highlight of each of, the, of all the, the songs on the on the CD. And it, and it combines a lot of different genres of music. It's, a, you know, it's like disco, party music, rock music, just whatever you want, basically. Well, it's pop. It's pop music, and that's what pretty much what I am. I'm a pop singer, and I my career has spanned from 75 till now. Yeah. And um, my voice is a pop voice. Um, so I, 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 this collection of songs on this CD, Ticket to the World, I have done because they're songs that I like to sing, songs I like to listen to, and songs for friends and fans. Oh, yeah. So that's pretty much why I did that. Oh, and it's good. Yeah. I like it. It's it's wonderful. I listen to it. It's in my iPod and my yeah. Nano. I listen to it all the time. Well, that's good. And I'm sure you sing to it, too. You, you kind of sing along once in a while. And <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, I sing along, definitely, especially when they're paying. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, you know what I mean, though, like, if you're in the car by yourself or, or whatever or however that goes and yeah. you listen to your stuff, you're like, gee, I sound pretty damn good, you know? Yeah, and, you know, especially uh, there's a there's a song that I love that when I'm going in between appointments or making, if I'm walking on the streets of New York, <clears throat> there are two songs particularly that I like to listen to. One of them is um, a song called New York City Boy. Okay. Which is, sounds to me like one of the best Village People songs that Village People never recorded. Yeah. Um, and the other one is my version of Rhinestone Cowboy. Okay, okay. Yeah, I've heard that in the sampler, yeah. Yeah, and uh, the way Rhinestone Cowboy starts out, it says, um, I've been walking these streets so long, um, singing the same old song, I know every crack on these dirty sidewalks of Broadway. <laughs> so it's uh, very appropriate for walking around. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. I've never been to New York. What's life like in New York? Oh, it's like no place else. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's great. It's it's um it's a huge city, but it uh and to people who visit and uh, and New York to New York that aren't that are guests and tourists, they may see it as this big looming um megalopolis that yeah is is daunting and maybe a bit intimidating oh yeah but for a city that has such huge buildings and large numbers of people and places and things there's something amazingly human about it um and far from being the intimidating place that a lot of people see those of us who live here um see it as it really is it's just a bunch of neighborhoods and small towns that just happen to be next door to each other oh yeah and for um those of us that live here, and there's a huge number of people that live here, eight or nine million people. Oh, yeah, dude. Um, I think we are a remarkable example of what the definition of what a city really is. Yeah. A place of civilization. Um, I'm really glad that I can call it um, a home now. I live here. I have. I mean, I, I love the, the home we have in North Carolina, but yeah. I also love... Um, calling North Carolina, I mean, New York City home. It is a, a wonderful place. I love New York, I love Manhattan, and I love the village. I have lived in the village my entire life. I am the only village person that ever lived in the village. <laughs> You're a last, lifetime village person. Village well, people. <laughs> uh, now, uh, uh, let me ask you this. Now, I hate to really uh, uh, end on, or uh, have it be on a sad note here, but were you there uh, during 9-11 at all? Yeah, yeah, of course we were. Uh, we were certainly here. We watched. <clears throat> live about, I live about a mile from those buildings. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, we mm. watched those buildings catch fire and burn and fall down. Okay. From the roof garden that I have. Okay. Um, so we watched all that happen. That was a a very surreal time. It was um a time. That, looking at that, it, it, it looked like we were watching a Dino De Laurentiis movie being filmed <laughs> with expe with spectacular special effects. Yeah, <clears throat> it was really um, a very strange, surreal thing to watch. Oh, I suppose the after effects. Yeah, and um, I just thought I think that's like that's like my generation's uh, Pearl Harbor. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll never forget how that happened yeah. and what it was like. Well, the thing the thing with that is, you know, I I remember that day and I remember exactly where I was that day. I was like I said, I've never been to New York, but I was just a, a senior in school, you yeah. know, and I was doing working at the well the local nursing home, and yeah, because I didn't have to. For the first six weeks of my senior year, I did not have to worry about going to school. I got paid to do a job at the nursing home, so that was kind of nice. But I I was there that day that it happened, and when we turned on the CNN news, and then we found out, oh, what the heck, somebody crashed into, a plane crashed into one of the buildings. And then, and then seeing the same result on the second side, you know. Exactly. <clears throat> But uh, it, it's it's pretty weird. I, I hate to hate to bring some sadness to the radio, but you know I figured since you're from New York, you probably can t share a story or two from that. You know, but uh, now back to your career now uh, with the, all the and, and I'm asked, I even asked Don Stroud this when I interviewed him uh, <clears throat> after everything that you accomplished, uh, and, and I know the fun's just still beginning, but. Uh, uh, have you had a, a great successful career? Do you do you feel like uh, the industry has really uh, took care of you pretty well? 
Do I? Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> I mean, I yeah, I have I've had a I've, I've had an incredibly wonderful, gifted, great career that uh, I think most anybody in this business would have want would have wanted to have. First yeah. of all. Most people never have a number one or a number two or a number three or a number four song, much less three or four of them. Yeah. Number one. Most people who are entertainers never achieve the 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 level this level the level of success yeah. of, of of being um, recognized and the recognition of by so many people. I have um, been so blessed to be part of something that. Millions and millions and millions of people around the world are aware of. Um, this year, we just passed um, in my career um, sales that have surpassed 100 million units okay. of CDs, tapes, um, cassettes, vinyl, DVDs, oh, videos, all of that. I mean, more than 100 million units have been sold over the past 30 years and um not many people achieve that oh. um i've i've been lucky to uh been able to stretch out and perform not only as a member of village people but i've been able to do television i've done if you go to my imdb page i've done tons of tv i've done film i i do stage uh musicals i've done about 30 different uh, broadway type musicals oh. i have Performed in in just about every media medium that there is, and um, I, 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 yeah, I, I feel I feel completely blessed and lucky. And um, Village People yeah. um, has been a, been a very lucrative and wonderful source of. Um, it's been a one, the financial rewards have been terrific, and they've been I've been very blessed by that. Um, and I continue to. I mean, yeah. you know, after having been working in a career for as long as I have, and and to still have some place that's paying you to get show up at eight o'clock at night, <laughs> and say some lines. I'm 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 a very very happy camper and working actor. Oh yeah, well, <laughs> I that, like it. Oh, that, that, and, and that's good. You know, it's just like you like. That's what you and I have a lot in common. With you, we like what we do. You know, yeah. I mean, it, it when, when, like like people always say, you know. If you like what you do, it's not work. It's yeah. just fun. <laughs> I would like to say, um, if, uh, and I would love, uh, first of all, um, I'm very proud of this um, project that I currently have, um, the, the CD, Ticket to the World. Yeah. Um, I um, feel very uh, lucky and, and um, very pleased that I've been able to get the material from the great writers that I've gotten from. I've got a... Um, your Disco Needs You, which opens, yep. which is uh, by Kylie Minogue and Robbie Williams. Oh, really? The great singers and writers. Um, I've got If I Can't Have You, written by the Bee Gees. Yep. Um, I've got I'm a Believer, written by Neil Diamond and originally recorded by the Monkees. I've got Sleeping, which is a wonderful song that was written by a singer, uh, a British singer called Rick Astley. I've got um, No Matter What, which is written by the incredible Sir Andrew Lloyd Webber, who wrote Phantom of the Opera and um, other uh, Sunset Boulevard, a lot of other great super hit musicals, including Cats. Um, I've got New York City Boy, which was written originally by the Pet Shop Boys, and right. they recorded it as a tribute to Village People, so I'm kind of taking it a step further and recording it um, and as an homage back to them, I've got um, an incredible um, kind of Sting-style jazz version of a Depeche Mode song called Free Love. Okay. And then um, there's my wonderful uh, kind of uh, country, country fried, um, chicken fried country two-step dance version <laughs> of um, Rhinestone Cowboy that I think people will like. I think they should give it a listen. Yeah, and uh, I think uh, with your permission, uh, do you think it's okay uh, as a way when I kick off the interview if I uh, if I go to your website because we have the access to uh, like uh, well not so much copy but like uh, a, a sounds that are playing on the computer on the website we could like dub into like the you know the computer and then uh, record it and 
You know? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, I can probably send you a copy. Okay. When would you? When do you want? When do you? Well, we'll see. Well, what we would do is. Uh, Wait, I, you get the copy and then cut this in, right? Well, e either that or uh, I can go to your website and uh, cut in that five-minute sampler. It doesn't really matter. Whatever, you, whatever you want me uh, to do is, because this won't air until well, well, it's airing right now, but it. Uh, uh, my third episode of my best of show. No, you know what we'll do? What we'll do is we will upload that um, that sampler as an MP3. Okay. And give you a web, uh, uh, um, an URL, a web, a, a, a place you can go to and download that. That'll be much higher quality. Okay. Okay. And that'll be perfect for you to play. Oh, cool! I I really appreciate that. And uh, yeah. well, I hate to. Uh, Hate to hate to run, but uh, I want well, to first of all thank you. I'm not gonna let you go yet, but thank you for giving me the opportunity to interview somebody like you. And it's very, uh, it's uh, a lot of respect has been earned and given, I think, to for, to let this interview happen. Oh, no, uh, Frankie, thank you very much. And do you need me to send you any information like bio or any any of that stuff? Well, if you could send me an autographed picture, that'd be cool. You know, <laughs> I can certainly do that. Let me... uh, now, email me. Yeah, I will email you my address. Now, one thing I'm going to have you do, and this is if you listen uh, to any of my other interviews on my MySpace page, whatever, uh -huh. I always have people give me a legal ID, mm -hmm. saying who you are, who you listen to, and what station you're listening to. Okay, well, tell me, give me the station call letters. It's uh, Pioneer 90.1. 90 or 98? 90, 90.1. Okay, Pioneer 90.1. Yep. Okay. And then I'm Frank. Did I say you're listening to Frankie Slauson? Yeah, if you want to, go right ahead. Okay. Hello, this is Randy Jones. I'm the original cowboy from Village People, and you're listening to Pioneer 90.1 with Frankie Slauson. All right. Thank you, man. And uh, like I say, uh, check out my MySpace page if you ever had a chance. Uh, all the interviews that I've done, not every interview that I've done is on there, but uh, I'll look up the current ones anyway, so. Okay, let me do that again. Okay. Let me do that interview, that, that, um. Legal ID? ID, yeah. Uh, okay. Hello, you're listening to Randy Jones, the original cowboy from Village People, and you're listening to Pioneer 90.1 with Frankie Slauson. Okay. How's that? That's better. I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like radio, right? Yeah, that's that's true blue radio. That's and I tell radio. you, what, I tell you what, you know, maybe one day you'll be lucky enough to do a, a tour through uh, Thief River. Who knows? You know. Now I'd like to tell me th how do you spell the name again? It's uh, Thief River, like thief, you know, like like, like thief, like robber thief, you know. Yeah. And then uh, T H I E F, right? Yeah. Okay. And then River, yeah. you know, and Falls. Thief River Falls, Minnesota. Wow, that's way up there, isn't it? <laughs> Hey, you're far away from us, too. So, uh, I know. All right, well, so send me an address, and I'll send you information. Uh, but I'll send you um, um, some uh, I'll send you some bio information to okay. your email anyway. Okay, I appreciate that. And uh, happy holidays, and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to meet you in the future. Thank you, Frankie. <clears throat> I'm very um, glad that you included me, and um, I'm glad we got this done. Well, I, I appreciate the fact that you... Uh, Give me the time to talk to you. Like I said, it's an honor, and uh, you have no idea how much respect I have for you because of this. You know. Thank you so much, and we certainly do help you. Appreciate you helping us get the word out about the CD. Oh yeah, and uh, we and I will give you the uh, online uh, address to listen to. Uh, we're we're an uh, online radio station as well, so that'll be great. And so that's archived there, right? Yep. Okay, good. All right. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.